So um, we are going to talk about likely and unlikely. Um, Amir, Tomer, uh, we would present ourselves in, in a moment. Uh, this talk started uh, about a year ago. Uh, a year ago, I was giving a talk in uh, our Chorus C++ meetup group. Um, I remember I was outside somewhere sitting um, with my laptop uh, and, and talking about playing with likely and unlikely, um, seeing that it actually in some cases affects the assembly, but doesn't affect so much the actual performance. And, and then Tomer was on the talk and, and he said, well, I'm playing there with that while you are speaking. And I see that there are some examples in which it does affect performance. And then we worked about this idea for a year. I mean, we just you know, played, researched, in order to come here and talk about this subject. So uh, a few words about myself. Uh, Amir Kirsch, I'm a lecturer here at the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo and Tel Aviv University. I'm also a member of the Israeli ISO C++ National Body, uh, co-organizer of this conference, and a developer advocate at Incredibuild, uh, the very short marketing pitch that I'm obliged for. Uh, Incredibuild is doing build acceleration. If you are suffering from slow builds, come talk with me or with uh, Incredibuild at the booth. Tomer, this is yours. Yes, I also have an avatar and uh, um, I'm a developer, C++ developer and uh, currently first time uh, presenting here, second time uh, attending this and um, working in uh, Dell, which uh, talking about Dell, uh, you can meet us in the booth outside. Uh, we do a very large scale um, uh, IOs, that's uh, storage, uh, distributed, very, very stable, and uh, if you're inst interested, we're hiring. So, there are two new attributes in C20. Well, attributes came in in C11, uh, and then later on, the new versions of C added attributes uh, like uh, fall through and, and uh, uh, no discard and likely and unlikely. And, and you can put likely and unlikely on branches in order to hint, in a way, uh, that something is more likely or more unlikely in order, at the end, to improve performance. At least this is the, the goal. Uh, so can, you can put it on, on if, on else, on switch cases, um, where, of course, you presume that something is more likely to happen or more unlikely. Um, like for in this example, if you think that it is, less it is less likely or more unlikely that n would be bigger than five, then you can hint the compiler uh, that this is the case. Uh, same here, uh, you think that case two is more likely, you can tell the compiler that this is the case uh, in the hope that the compiler can do something with that information. So, uh, if we go back to history, uh, in fact, GCC and other compilers had that before with intrinsic uh, options like built-in expect, uh, which took two uh, uh, parameters, um, and, and you could actually give the percentage that you think is the likelihood. Uh, people used to have uh, macros for that. And then it was proposed to be added to the language, and it was added to the language. There is a Stack Overflow link here uh, discussing the old macros. Uh, so when it was added to the language, um, everything is, of course, a bit long, so we would not read the entire section from the spec. Let's focus on this sentence. It is intended to allow implementations to optimize for the case where paths execution included are arbitrary more likely. What does it mean, arbitrary more likely? Well, it means that you assume that something would happen more um, without actually saying how much more uh, than any alternative path of execution that does not include such, uh, such uh, attribute. Uh, it is interesting to note that the spec has a note in the below that says excessive usage of either of these attributes is liable to result in performance degradation like a disclaimer that you, on, on any medicine that you get, that there is the disclaimer. So know that if you hurt something, it is on you, okay? So yeah, uh, you, you, you should think about that. And, and we will discuss that. Yes, you can hurt performance. 
So, so the question is why? I, I mean, why do we need that? What, how can it help? And, and in order to understand why, um, we, we should ask what the compiler can do with that, what the optimizer can do with it. And I think, uh, Tora, I would let you continue from here. Yeah, uh, okay, so the compiler is this uh, magical thing that uh, does a lot of uh, very sophisticated stuff, right? But basically it takes uh, C++ code as input and transforms it into machine code, which you can run on the CPU. Uh, maybe I can, I can yeah. try to be here. Let's see if we don't get feedback. Okay, great. Um, so why would we want to hint uh, the compiler about this likely and unlikely stuff? Uh, well, maybe it can improve the code layout of the bytecode in the end. Maybe that's like a better uh, putting it in a different order. Which then the, the question is, why code layout matters? Yeah, so we will discuss it in a bit and see, zoom in on the CPU which runs our code and, and try to guess why it, it helps. And another idea is maybe it improves our branch, branch instructions, like if we have to get the decision and if else, and that also translates in, into some kind of a branch in the bytecode. Maybe the compiler can do something better there. But uh, it is important to remember that these are all depend on microarchitectures. So the bytecode is architecture based. You can get a x86 bytecode or x86 64-bit bytecode or maybe ARM bytecode. But the actual CPU going to run it on might have different character characteristics, for example, between Intel and AMD. So the compiler needs to know exactly which one you're going for to optimize it best for that specific CPU. But the ideas are generic. Um, so let's look at one example. Uh, a pretty recent uh, um, CPU from Intel, Skylake architecture. And there, this is from the Intel uh, optimization guide. You, you can see this uh, complicated drawing. And basically it shows the pipeline of running instructions. Which, which resembles, I, I would say, many other architectures. I mean, it's specific, but it's very similar to other architectures. Yeah, it, it's, it's basic. Uh, uh, the idea is shared between uh, many of them. And you have the main memory really, really far away from the CPU. And from there you start fetching instruction. At first it comes to the L2 cache, and then to the L1 cache and then goes through a branch predictor, and then goes to the decoded iCache. That's where the instruction cache for the decoding instructions already in the internal uh, language of the CPU. And then it starts uh, trickling through that pipeline, which is long. It doesn't look like this here, but it's, it's long. You want to always fill it. You don't want to waste time on uh, not running any, uh, anything. When the one instruction is already uh, progressing through the next stage of the pipeline, you want to push a next instruction into the first step. Always keep pushing them. Inside. Which sounds, uh, to me now, it sounds like, okay, we do understand why you need likely and unlikely because it, it maybe it would help the CPU to understand what should be the next instruction. Right. Or and not. And mainly, it, it helps it bring it earlier from the main memory, because the main memory is far. It's like going to the public library to get a book. You have to plan to drive there. You want to do it as early as possible. You don't want to do it while you're working on the code. Uh, so yeah, basically, likely code paths, hot code paths, you want them to be close together. So you won't have to have a lot of work to get them from the memory. They're already there. And cold paths should be far away, so they don't take up space for the hot paths. Let's take a look at the actual code, and, and, and then if, if you want to understand the code layout, then we can take a look at the assembly. Right, so we have a basic example here. I don't know if you can see the last row, but this is just a switch case. We have uh, 10 cases. Case 0 is going to function foo 0. Case 1, foo 1, and so on. And as the default case goes to bar, classical name. And uh, you probably recognize these colors from the Compiler Explorer, right? Everyone knows about that. Uh, so let's take a look at what it looks like. Uh, first of all, we have the, just the logic of the switch, and let's just zoom a bit on it. Um, we have we compare the number, the input, to 9, because if it's bigger than 9, that's the default case. We have to treat that special. So if it's, if it's bigger than 9, we go to the default case. That's a conditional branch, right? We need to first decide if it's bigger than 9. That's a computation. And then only uh, decide if to jump or not. And we, if we want to fill our pipeline, we have to do this decision even before we finish the calculation. Calculation is still working. 
And then, uh, well, if it's not the default case, then we do a jump by address. That's the switch table, which is uh, kind of a feature in, uh, from the C days that uh, uses the capabilities of jumping by pointer in the CPU to jump to many, many different addresses uh, in a single instruction. Uh, so just looking at the order of things, it's kind of arbitrary. It looks like there's some order, but really, um, for some reason, GCC, which uh, we took this code from, puts uh, case number eight as the first case, and uh, case number nine after it, and then it goes to case zero, and the only one which is kind of not arbitrary is the default. The default is last. So already we see that the compiler gets some kind of hint from us as uh, code writers. And it, the hint is, if it's the default case, put it last in the code. It's probably not the hot code for us. And in, in this case, we didn't have any likely and unlikely in the code. Right. So it's just what the compiler does without any hint. So let's add them. Uh, here, we added, we added uh, that case five is unlikely and case seven is likely. And what did the compiler do? It put case five last. Well, almost last, because the default is still after that. And uh, case seven, it's pushed first. It's much closer to the code from the start, which we're going to run anyway. So there's a better chance that when we start fetching the instructions from memory, the first case will get fetched with the code. And um, well, the in, in the previous example, uh, despite saying that uh, five is unlikely, still the compiler kind of puts the default even unlikelier after that. But if we can try to put likely. Yeah, maybe the default is likely. And uh, well, yeah, then it puts it first. So, so that's nice. at least it listens to us. But we see that there are kind of uh, defaults, well, default uh, decisions for the compiler. And we can sometimes override them if we really want to. Well, it's if, if we want the iCache and the coded iMesh is, is very, very uh, tight. We don't have a lot of space. We don't want to space, waste space for things that aren't uh, relevant. So just putting things together makes it easier for the compiler. For the recording, for, the question was, the, what does it, why oh. does it matter that if you have a jump, that you have it uh, at last, in, in the last position, or in first, because you have a jump, and the answer is, yeah, it, it relates to what I get into the instruction cache. You, you can think of uh, the, the CPU just kind of ignoring all the things at the bottom, not even bringing them to, into view and not wasting space in the iCache. So OK, we had this uh, slide, and now we can kind of answer it. Yes, the compiler can use this information to improve the layout. It does that. We saw this here. And uh, so, so um, OK. Uh, Instruction, uh, instruction cache would be improved, I mean, if it is in the proper position. But maybe there, are, there is more than that. Maybe we can even improve branch prediction. Yeah. So branch prediction is, is kind of a, a term with two meanings. We have in the CPU world uh, a branch predictor inside it. We actually, it was there in the diagram from uh, Skylake from Intel. And this uh, component. It tries to predict the most likely branch. We, we said uh, we always want to fill the pipeline. Even before finishing the previous instruction, we already have to decide what's the next instruction to run, and even the one after that, after that and the one after that. And we have to do that by predicting. Uh, so the CPU does that. It always tries to estimate what's the next instruction to run. And that's difficult when we have a conditional branch, but still we have to try. And it kind of sees just a narrow window of the execution. It sees machine code, doesn't see the program, right? It doesn't see C++. It just sees bytecode from the machine. Um, a branch prediction is very costly. We don't want to do that. We, a branch misprediction, so. And on the other hand, oh, yeah, we have this uh, very famous or infamous uh, Stack Overflow question. Why is processing uh, a sorted array faster than processing an unsorted array? That's, that means. First, maybe sorting it and then actually uh, doing the processing, it could be faster because it's easier for the processor to predict, when the, uh, depending on what you do on the array. But if you do some kind of decision and you sort according to that, according to that decision, you might get like the whole first half of the array gets one kind of branch and the second half another kind. It's much easier for the processor to predict that when running. 
Uh, but before the CPU even gets a chance to run our code, we have the compiler, right? The compiler looks at the whole program in C++ high-level code and tries to predict also what is going to happen. It wants to do that to make things more efficient. For example, putting the default case, which is probably less likely, putting that at the end. So uh, our prediction would be that the compiler branch predictor can earn from our likely and unlikely um, uh, nodes. Uh, but what about the CPU? Can we also help the CPU with uh, branch prediction? Right. So yeah, what's the connection between them? So let's look at an example and try to you know, figure it out. This is a very basic function that has kind of a log two of the integer, kind of you know, count the number of bits by repeatedly dividing by two and counting the number of times we divided. And uh, you know, as humans, we can look at this uh, in a high level way and draw this nice diagram, uh, which uh, you know, it's kind of the, the structure of the program, right? We have a for loop, in, oh, a while loop inside the uh, green rectangle, and uh, we have two cases, two and false, which w two stays in the loop, false exits, and uh, if it's true, we could do the code and go back to you know checking in. And the CPU going is which is going to run this is going to see that we're going a lot of times in the loop. So it's going to see from just collecting kind of statistics. Uh, going to see that uh, this is the likely case. After once or twice or three times, you're going to see, oh, this code usually stays in the loop. It usually chooses the two branch here. So I'm going to predict that. It might miss the first time, maybe in the second, but after that, it's probably going to guess right. It doesn't know anything about the program. It doesn't see C++, just sees bytes code, but it sees the real runtime. It sees actually things running. That's a pretty good way to estimate things based on the history. And you know, can we actually affect the branch predictor? Maybe help it out? Maybe you know, destroy it? I don't know. Um, well, there's the idea of branch hints. That's injecting into the code, into the bytecode, opcodes hints that would help uh, the, the branch predictor. And Intel uh, did some kind of, let's call it an experiment on this, uh, and added two uh, opcodes. One that uh, hints branch is taken. That means you, you jump. And one uh, means branch is not taken. You don't jump. You just continue to the next instruction. And uh, I'm saying it, it was an experiment because it was added in uh, Pentium 4 and then uh, subsequently removed from the spec. So now it's reserved for future use. Um, actually, one of those codes already, already being used in the newest uh, architectures as a hint for something else. And you're probably not going to write C20 code for Pentium 4 target, right? So that's not relevant to. Uh, let's look at another architecture. Okay, maybe x86 doesn't use it, but maybe another one does. ARM architecture, well, it just doesn't have any hints at all. Uh, maybe Power, PowerPC. Um, well, it, it has. It's not used as far as I could tell in uh, Power of 64 compilation, 64 bits, uh, after trying it out a bit with Compile Explorer. And um, well, it's kind of discouraged in the spec. You, you, you have to re like be really, really sure about it to actually put the hints. Otherwise, don't do it. Um, so another idea is, OK, we said that the predictor, the branch predictor uses the history. But what if we don't have any history yet? What if it's the first time we're seeing this thing? So maybe can, we can help with that. So it's interesting already to see that Intel and AMD don't really agree on, on how to do that. So if you're compiling for Intel and you want to help for the first branch, uh, you're going to have to do it differently than if you're compiling for AMD. And I mean, they don't really agree on it because actually it doesn't really, really matter. It's just the first time we're seeing something in a loop. It's kind of cold code. It's not your performance bottleneck the, the first time you're seeing something. And maybe it's not the first time. Maybe you saw it, but it was so long ago that, you know, the Processor kind of forgot about it. it. It you know evicted that kind of information from the internal caches because it, it uses them for something more relevant. Then that means again it's it's cold code. It's not your performance bottleneck. Your performance bottleneck is going to be hot code, and it's going to uh, see it again and again and again, and that's going to have good predictions usually. 
And uh, there's also the a, a question of indirect branches. That's what we saw in the switch uh, example. It's a bit more complicated, but the basic idea is the same. We have a branch predictor, and it uh, well, the first time it might not know anything, but after that, it's going, going to be, uh, make a very good guess. So, you know, in summary, not really. The compiler is not going to affect the CPU branch predictor. But, you know, that's not the end of it. We already saw some good things here. And um, we'll continue to see maybe more. Um, so, what? So, we're back to the compiler. We cannot actually affect the CPU branch predictor, but the compiler can know things from likely and unlikely. unlikely. Yeah, and it can help it. Well, for example, we saw that layout, and we'll see more, some more here. So, back to this example, like, why did I draw this uh, in such a specific way? Well, because GCC, the compiler, can actually emit this. This is not just uh, me as a human being seeing the structure. GCC also knows the structure of the program. Of course, it sees C++. It's a high-level language. It knows about loops. It knows about returning from a function. It knows about exiting a loop or continuing in the loop. And curiously enough, it also gives some interesting estimations here. And um, I don't know if you can see this, but it says here that continuing the loop has 89% chance while exiting the loop has 11% chance. And if we continue in the loop, then going back is 100% chance, right? We have to check again the condition there. It knows that we draw this uh, diagram. It, it, this GCC is, draw that. Yeah, and if you want to follow along at home, uh, you can just run these two instructions and you get, you get this. Um, so it, it knows because it's a loop. So it assumes that staying in a loop is more likely. It got to this 89% number somehow. Um, we'll talk about it in a bit. And um, well, OK, but let, you know, we know it's likely. So let's add it anyway. Um, this is the code before, the assembly output from before. And this is from after adding likely. D do you see the difference maybe? The crowd, do, do you uh, see any difference between when we add the likely uh, or not in the assembly? It, no, it might be very uh, subtle. Yeah. You have to take a look. Yeah, there's no difference. And well, there is no. Yeah. I mean, well, it makes sense because when we add the likely and look at the percentages, we change from 89% to 90% changing, staying in the loop. That's what we did with, by adding likely. We told the compiler it's uh, likely to stay in the loop, and it said, OK, 90% likeliness. Uh, that also kind of answers the question about arbitrarily. Because we need to give this arbitrary thing a number, and the number is 90%, which is very similar to the original estimation. We're not getting anything special here. In, what, in what this, specific this specific case. What does this percentage, uh, uh, what is the implication of difference between 89 and 90? So the question was, what are the implications of this uh, GCC analysis? It's in a certain uh, phase of the compilation where it analyzes the code and says, okay, I presume that it would be 90%. What are the implications? Well, the implications would be code layout. But in yeah, order to decide what should be the code layout, it first analyzes, oh, what are the percentage of each branch? And the difference between 80, 90, and 90 is nothing. Is nothing. In, this case. in case of two branches, like... Uh, that's correct. If there percent. would be maybe more branches, then maybe it may affect, but in this case, there is no effect. That's a great question. That's a good question. So, <laughs> so the question was, maybe if you put unlikely, it would change things. Yeah, and it's a great question because it's the next slide, right? Um, <laughs> so let's change it to unlikely. And, and yeah, OK, so unlikely to stay in the loop, likely to exit it. That's 90% exiting. And this does create a difference. Uh, you can see it put the return of the function very, very close to the start. It, likes, it sees that it's likely to skip the whole body of the function. Can we see it side by side? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So uh, staying in the loop is likely. That means returning is unlikely. It's far away. And skipping the loop is, un is likely. Is, well, sorry. Staying in the loop is unlikely. That's the same as you know, uh, returning very early. And of course, sorry, we still have to support returning in the end. Yeah, it's, it's still here. We, we can't uh, ignore that, but we have a uh, we used, actually used space at the beginning of the function to get a fast, fast exit from the function. These examples were from GCC, the assembly. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we tried also with Clang. Yeah, and if we want to start a flame wall, like uh, Clang versus GCC. So, um, well, many examples we tried. 
uh, just, uh, just did effect clang. It seems to uh, kind of ignore uh, the effect of likely violently. It did affect the switch case we saw at the start, but it didn't affect uh, many other cases. So we're going to just uh, continue with GCC for now. And also it gives that nice uh, graph that we saw, which is very helpful for you know, visualizing it here. So let's see more examples, and again, uh, it's all here. Um, this uh, uh, slide code, don't use it in, in the real, uh, yeah, uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does different does, do you mean that, that different compilers behave differently? And what does the standard have to say about like in and like? How does that affect the So the question was, was uh, different compilers, do, do they uh, behave differently? Oh. And does the standard say something about how the compiler should take likely and unlikely? Well, we saw what the standard says, right? It was on the first slide. That's all it says. So that's up to compiler, uh, you know, compiler and they teams. Do, they do behave differently. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, it's part of the um, uh, competition between Clang and GCC. Who wins the benchmarks? Um, there's a lot of room there. So uh, just a you know, for loop and an if and then early return with the if, just checking if the number is prime uh, just by you know, dividing uh, what we learned in the uh, uh, computer programming 101. Uh, we can again uh, see this nice output. We see all these numbers that GCC invented. It thinks that uh, skipping this whole thing has 5% chance. And I know uh, exiting from here also has 5% chance. That's exiting from the if, entering the loop but then exiting after checking the if. Which is, again, without any likely analysis, just the ana analysis of, of uh, GCC. Yeah, it, it basically gives a very low chance of just you know, exiting early, let's call this thing. And uh, yeah, we see this here. And uh, by adding unlikely, which is the opposite of the default, we're saying basic, sorry. Which is like what he Sorry, the, it, it, it is like, right? We change it from 5% to 10%. Again, this is the magical 90-10 uh, number here. Uh, but we can also do the opposite of the default, and it's maybe more interesting. And then we actually get you know, a good chance of exiting early. The, the previous one was quite interesting, because when we say unlikely, which means, oh, uh, we don't think that we, you would go g get there, it went up from 5% to 10%. I mean, before that, it was 5%. And, and then we said, no, 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 it's unlikely. So we said, okay, 10%. <laughs> yeah. This is GCC? This is GCC, GCC. everything is GCC. Um, by the way, like, which version is better from an algorithm uh, point of view or something? Well, well, we'll see later. I mean, it's all bad because it's just divides, but. Uh, yeah. This seems compliant with the standard, because the standard says that more uh, likely or less likely than the other branches, not with this branch without the other uh, Yeah, not compared to another program yeah, completely. The, right? the comment by your ear is mm -hmm. it is still compliant with the spec because it doesn't uh, uh, you know, uh, decide what would be the percentage. It, it actually doesn't decide what should be the outcome of, of what you say for likely and unlikely. It does need to still support all the options of actually running, but statistics, yeah, it can do anything. And the reason for the 10% is most probably, I mean, we open the code. And, and there is a, a, just a decision there that if you say unlikely, yeah. it is 10%. It's actually even documented here, uh, predicted likely by hot label predictor. The predictor is the one that sees the hot label. The hot label is us writing likely. That's, that's just that. And uh, okay, let's take another example. Uh, those examples were kind of C-like, right? Um, for loops and such. And now we'll do something C++ and exception. So we have this uh, very simple function. Gets a string view. If it's uh, too short, it says that um, the password is too short and throws an exception. Do, do you think that exceptions are, uh, you know, by default for the compiler likely or unlikely without saying anything? Unlikely. Yeah, should be unlikely, should be. right? And it, I mean, yeah, I mean, exceptions are the exceptional case, right? So yeah, it gives it 0%, round zero. And even more than that, it actually takes the function we wrote and splits it into two parts and marks the whole exception handling part as called. Why would it do that? To help the linker later take that whole part of the function, just throw it as far as away as possible. Which means to split the function in the binary into two sections. At the end, 
No, there are other reasons why exceptions are, are costly, but here it just says that no, exceptions would, should not happen, and I assume they would not, and this is why I put the exception card far away. It's, it's more just to bring more space, uh, to leave more space for hot code. That, that's like the decision going on here. Uh, okay, so let's do it. I mean, we know that putting unlikely is uh, it's unlikely, but let's put it likely. When it, and if you do that, you're probably writing like uh, bad code, right? You're saying that the exception is likely. You're not following the idea that exceptions are exceptional. But still, let's do that. Let's see. And uh, well, we did likely, and it's still zero. Compilers, you don't even know how to handle this thing that, that an exception is likely. Compiler is smarter than you. Uh, okay, another example. Oh, sorry. Um, maybe, maybe a bit more. I don't know. Um, this is like a pseudo real code from Linux uh, kernel. And in Linux, you're going to see a lot of things like this. You see this unlikely micro. This is the historical gran grandfather of, the, of our modern likely. Um, uses the built-in, we can think of it as being the same. And basically, if uh, some pointer is null, then just return an error code. So uh, this is what GCC uh, would uh, predict. It predicts 10%, uh, right? We said it's unlikely, well, we know unlikely 10%. Okay, great. Let's remove the unlikely and see what happens. It predicts 0.45%. That's the default without saying anything, it's even unlikelier than saying unlikely. Uh, how did it get to this specific number? Well, we need to like dive into the code of the compiler of GCC and uh, start uh, imagining we're a compiler and we're looking at this code and we're starting from predicting that there's a 100% chance of getting to any line. But then, you know, it's not really 100%, it's inside of an if case, an if clause, right? So, well, we, to get there, we need to compare some pointer to null and we, uh, comparing to none doesn't seem very likely to happen, right? So let's just you know, give a discount of 70%. And actually, if we do that, we also do an early return. We also already saw this example. Returning early from a function is probably not likely another discount. And um, we, we're returning a const number. That also seems uh, fishy, like we're returning some kind of error code, so another discount. And actually, it's even a negative const so that must be a, an error code. That's like, no way. And, and that's how we get to this uh, number. And these numbers are from the actual compiler? Yeah, from the source code. And you can see in, in uh, Compiler Explorer, but textual version of all these numbers inside. Um, but saying unlikely means, well, it is not so unlikely, as you said. It's just regular unlikely. Yeah, then the, com then the programmer comes and you know, puts unlikely and you know, overrides this whole thing and says, 10% chance. Okay, so we saw that the compiler has uh, very complicated heuristics. This was a very uh, yeah, specific example of you know, getting to the, the most uh, extreme case. It can be also something like maybe 30% and then you can help it a bit by saying 10% you know, uh, only. Uh, in any case, putting likely or unlikely is a very crude mechanism of overriding it. Okay, so, but it's an override mechanism still, so we can override, we can do the opposite, right? And we did so you see those examples in some cases. So, you know, let's see how much we can get if we are smarter and we are doing things that the compiler isn't predicting. Um, benchmarking is getting hard uh, in general, and uh, I'm no expert on this. You know uh, that benchmarking is, is another reward for cheating, right? <laughs> and um, micro benchmarking, which we're going to do, is even extra hard. Um, but we still, we need to talk about performance, so we have to do it anyway. Uh, let's compare two versions of this is prime uh, function we saw, and we'll use uh, AWS because it's uh, easy to use and because it's stable. That's maybe the most important part for me now, getting a stable measurement that I can compare. Uh, we have uh, two instances, one is very cheap and one is a bit pricier, and we're using uh, Linux and GCC 11 and uh, using this uh, compilation uh, command. And you might ask yourself, why 0.2 and not 0.3? There's a bunch of reasons. There are a lot of people who practically use 0.2, even for the release version of code, for various reasons. And uh, even if you think you're using 0.3, you should ask yourself, what happens if my code somehow reaches compilation with 0.2? It, it often happens. 
But anyways, the conclusion applied to all three as well. So we have these two versions. Same thing, except putting likely in one and unlikely in the other. And unlikely, that's the, almost the default case, right? But just for comparison, we did it anyway. Before we show the results, what do you think would be the actual result? Which number did you try? <laughs> mm. yeah, oh, that's it, a great it, it question. Which, that's what are, what's the input? Yeah. That's it. So uh, I just try numbers. That doesn't matter. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not your real code, right? Uh, but uh, OK, so this is like the function, the code that I did. There's the two functions. There's the main. The main uh, first initializes the numbers. It's outside of the benchmark. And then runs the benchmark twice, once on uh, the likely function and once on the unlikely function. And what's the benchmark? Well, it's based on uh, cppreference.com, so credit to that. And uh, basically, it's a nice lambda that uh, takes the high, uh, it's called high res uh, clock from Chrono lab and uh, takes it now and does the function on all the numbers, one after the other, and then takes another call to now and subtracts, and that's the result in seconds. So this is the result. Um, likely it takes 6.6 .6 seconds, and unlikely it takes 5. Point, almost 6 seconds. Likely is slower than 10% for these specific inputs. Which is a bit surprising because we would expect the vice versa. I don't know. Depends on the input. I have no idea. I don't really mind, care about this function. Yeah, but, <laughs> but it's more we for the idea. see that these numbers are just noise in a moment. Yeah. How many times have you run it? Are you confident about that? Yeah, it's very stable. No, uh, we are confident what? that this is just noise. We'll <laughs> show you that in a moment. <laughs> How can we tell that this is just noise? It is the same assembly. OK, we, we will talk uh, yeah. about that in a moment. Yeah, yeah. So and we uh, have I'm a few questions. Uh, so we would take a question from there and, and one from here. So we did try, we yes. We tried to swap them. So yeah, we did swap them, and we get another result. We will talk about micro benchmarking in a moment. Another question. How can we make okay. sure that it is not the CPU branch predictor? Uh, we'll answer that also in a moment. OK, okay? we will discuss that. Yeah. So yes, yes, we did try to swap them. Uh, but before that, um, so benchmarking is hard. We already said that. We're not really sure about these results. Um, why aren't we sure? Because we read this excellent, excellent paper, uh, which says uh, basically when you're benchmarking, a lot of things can throw off your measurements. And one of them is code placement. And uh, wait, code placement is the thing we showed earlier with the switch example and the if example and everything. So we are measuring the same thing that also causes issues with measurements. It's extra complicated. But you know, let, let's, let's try like something. Let's try switching the order. And we're just taking the same file and just switching the order of declarations, the definitions of the functions, doing the same thing over and getting different results. Now it's the same. Switching there, so right, right. Um, okay, yeah, we can also. Okay, I switched the definition here. We can also switch uh, these calls between them. We can do a lot of things. Um, we didn't do all of them. Um, we will take questions after yeah. that. So, so to comment, yes, yeah, please. So I, what I think happened is that the CPU has this called uh, I ca uh, instruction cache decoder. Now, if you look, it's 30 bytes in size, and it's aligned to 30 bytes. This, the, it doesn't decode the instruction. It just fits to this already decoded cache. Now, if this is the case, and this happens completely randomly, you can compile the same file two times and get two, two different alignments. And that would definitely explain the numbers you're getting here. Why is it about 10 times, 10 percent slower yeah. when you see the same assembly? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, co I'll comment on that. So the, the comment is uh, that uh, the compiler, and specific the alignment of the output code can matter a lot to for the eye cache. If the function is aligned in some way or unaligned, it can help or not help for the eye cache. Uh, one of the answers is that the compiler usually aligns functions because it knows about that idea. And, and yeah, I mean, it is an issue. And that's part of what uh, that uh, excellent paper talked about. Alignment really, really matters. and. Um, the point is, um, when you benchmark like this thing in a macro benchmark, it doesn't mean anything about your actual production code. Because your actual production might have the functions in another order. Um, 
so okay, we saw that it's hard to measure. Let's just you know, let's look at the assembly. Maybe it's it's easier to look at the assembly. So um, it's kind of small. So I'll help you here. There's no difference. It's the same thing. Both functions, the likely and unlikely, get the same assembly. And this is actually what started this whole talk because when Amir presented, uh, he's talking the meetup, and I just in the background uh, tried these things out, and I got uh, 10 or maybe 30 percent improvement. And in the end, it was all noise. It was the same function after my changes, the same assembly. So th that's kind of kind of thing you can get to when you try to micro benchmark. The labels, by the, the way, are different. The name. Yeah, of the, <laughs> the name of function. <laughs> and one of them says that uh, jump if greater equal, and the other less than. But then the operands are also in the other way, so it's the same thing. Um, so it's a bug in GCC because we saw likely and unlikely do have an impact on optimizations. One is 10 percent, the other is 90 percent. I so mean, we see that the analyzer shows 90%, 10%. So why shouldn't it affect the code layout? Yeah. So there is a bug opened mm -hmm. by Tomer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, it basically just mixes up. It just doesn't see the, the, in, the content of the attribute. It uh, sees the, the, the reason is that uh, code folding. It, it says, oh, I sold the same code, and it ignores the, the attribute, even though there was an attribute there. And it says, oh, it's the same code. I would compile it. I would save the time to compile it and just use the code that I saw earlier. Yep. And uh, well, it's an example of that uh, excellent paper striking again. 10% difference for nothing, absolutely nothing. Oh, so um, yeah. so Do we need it's the same assembly. Same assembly. In the case where you create a single object file. Right. That's, that's correct. If you, which same. is attempt number three, yeah. if you divide them into two separate uh, uh, programs, then. Uh, yeah, and then, and then we might also uh, solve the problem of training one of the benchmarks on the previous benchmark because we're just running them in different uh, programs. And uh, well, there is a difference actually. And uh, likely version is faster. It, it's not the obvious uh, version, like the obvious estimate of the compiler would be unlikely. For these specific inputs that we fed here, likely is actually better by 10%. So we can get something here if we're smart about it. Um, is it related to uh, Dash O2? Uh, the specific results you, we see here are related to Dash O2 because it's really uh, depends on the alignment and where the function goes and uh, all the optimizations. But the ideas are still the same for O3. So I got lucky here about uh, compiling in some way where putting the same functions together creates one option, which is the opposite of the correct result or the correct, more correct result we see here. But you know, with O3, it might be the same, might not be. Another architecture, another compiler version, anything could happen. We'll take some questions later on because uh, yeah, we want we'll to make sure that we would uh, uh, take all the slides that we want. Just for clarification, if it's the same assembly, how come the. No, okay, so now we. we uh, uh, no, we walked around the bug, the GCC bug. GCC bug, GCC has a code folding uh, feature, which is saying, saying the same piece of code twice and says, oh, I already saw that, let's just kind of merge them together. It's not the same code. One has likely and one that ha has ha unlikely. How, how much is the assembly uh, different? They're different. Uh, well, it's oh, it's we saw that uh, in, in a previous slide. Uh, you saw that the, there is a difference in the code layout. Well, sounds most probably, but uh, it might be that this is not the case. Okay, so this is opposite, and always, always measure on, for your specific circumstances. Um, but the, the, okay, there is a difference here, even if we don't fully like uh, understand it, or if it's not fully relevant for our case because it's just a toy function. Still, we want to understand where it's coming from, and um, well, it must be the code layout, right? So there's a tool, a Linux tool called Perf, and we'll, we'll need a more expensive uh, comp uh, virtual machine to actually use it for this case. And uh, we can run both of them and, uh, for Perth and, and see, and we can actually see things for like branches and branch misses, and it's, it's pretty much the same, which makes sense because we're not really looking at the code layout. All these default uh, statistics that it gives us are not for code layout, look for other things. But we can call it with uh, appropriate options that give us the code layout stuff, and specific the cache misses, iCache and dcache, uh, loads and misses. And we can see that for the iCache, there is a, a slightly higher uh, number here, 
which means that maybe it took all the hot code inside the function, put it nicely together in the right space, and the cold code farther away, so the cold code doesn't waste space in the I cache, which is very small, by the way. So th there is a comment here that we still have noise. Yes, we still have noise. Uh, we cannot come and say, oh, we can tell you that one is better than the other. And we would tell in the summary, do your own benchmarks. We would have this disclaimer. So uh, it, it kind of does work out. So I, OK, I can't give you the exact reason for the iCash misses. But assuming they are there already, we can see them, uh, the timing difference Makes sense. So yeah, so, here's the summary. To summarize, uh, and I think that we may have some uh, time for questions, so you can keep your uh, questions. Um, potential benefit. So uh, likely and un unlikely, we saw effects compiler branch predictor, which affects code layout that we saw, uh, and it may improve instruction cache. It doesn't uh, affect at the end the uh, CPU branch predictor by itself, uh, unless it relates in a way to the code layout. But we, we also discussed that code layout by itself has different implications for different architectures for CPU branch predictor. So um, it, it, you want to use it if in a way you think that changing the code layout has uh, an actual effect. Um, is it worse the hassle? Uh, so in most simple cases, the compiler branch predictor sees the same, or maybe even sees better, as we saw. Uh, thus, it might not have any effect at all. By the way, when we see that there is a difference between 90% or 95%, it might be that the code layout at the end would be the same. Uh, in some cases, it's just being ignored because it competes with other optimizations. And it is easy to have bad likely and unlikely. Uh, for example, as code changes, you think that, that so something is likely, Comments, and then you. things changes uh, rather uh, would be the code itself or the inputs that you are using, and you keep the likely or unlikely, which would be a pessimization at the end. You, you mean, uh, um, the question, there is a very nice was, article uh, on the, on the subject. While we were exploring, we saw others talking about the subject. And this one is titled, uh, Don't Use Likely and Unlikely. Yes. Uh, bottom line, be careful with what you ask for. This is true always. Uh, the same way it may help, it can also hurt. Consider using likely and unlikely only in cases where the call ratio between the branches would be significantly different than what the compiler would assume. How can you know what the compiler would assume? Well, in GCC, you can you know, create these diagrams if you want, uh, and only in cases where it should matter for performance. Otherwise, we are just playing. Um, take a look at the assembly and do your own benchmarks. Looking forward, uh, compilers. So Tomer opened the bag on, on identical uh, code which has different likely and unlikely and in GCC creates the same code at the end even though it has different uh, um, likely and unlikely. Um, so we would be happy to see this being fixed. Um, it should not completely override the estimations of the compiler. So if we say unlikely on something that initially the compiler assumed to be 95%, or 5% or for unlikely. When you say unlikely, you should assume it would be less, even less unlikely, or even you know, <laughs> less than 5%, and not come up to 10%. So the current code just says, OK, unlikely is 10%. We would assume that a better uh, approach would be to use the current estimation and add to that what the uh, programmer uh, was saying in the code. Uh, Clang should do something there as well. Um, maybe it should be a function expression. 
because uh, currently the programmer can uh, only say likely, unlikely. He cannot add the uh, exact, um, you know, the percentage that he wants to say or she wants to say. Uh, while, you know, the old intrinsic in GCC add that. You could have add the actual ratio or the actual percentage, and now you cannot. So maybe there is a room for an actual function expression. Um, and maybe um, maybe it can be um, used together with PGO, with uh, profiler guided optimization. Maybe even you can run the code and then let PGO get into your source code or create any, another uh, artifact that you can then feed back to your code and have the actual percentage in the code in a way. That might be nice. So there are some uh, comments that we would take later that Intel compiler maybe have that and other uh, comments that we would take in a moment. We are very, I know that it is quite likely that you are expecting lunch, it, it is quite near. Uh, this is the thank you slide. And right after we have a question slide. So questions and comments, thank you. You, you mean uh, the question by Udi here was uh, in order to get the percentage you, you can provide in the old uh, intrinsic? Yes. By the, yeah, the, the default is the 90-10 we saw, even for the intrinsic. How I extracted, the, you can see it in Compact Explorer uh, using uh, the special flag uh, dash f dump uh, trees, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, but but uh, the question I thought you asked, so I'll answer it anyway because I think it's relevant. Uh, the default here is 9010, and for the likely unlikely attributes, it's the only option. Actually, for the old intrinsics, you can override that uh, from a compiler flag. You can say the default is not 9010, it's now 955 or something else. You see, like, when you do the old routine, you'll see, if I'm writing, I don't know, 70%, you'll see on the GCC, it's now 70%? Yeah, yeah it, it does affect the numbers, but it doesn't necessarily affect the assembly. I mean, maybe the change between 70%, 90%, and 95% does not change the assembly for your function. Maybe it does.